I like the personal responsibility that the lyrics share. Sometimes, not in this church, I can truly say that because our worship pastor is very, very on top of making sure we have good theology in our singing and ministry. But sometimes you can be in churches or even listen to a song and say, that song don't make. It's not good theology. It's not grounded in scripture, but it has a good beat. So everybody flowing with it. But I love the personal responsibility that comes out of the lyrics. I will. We like to put things on our job. We like to put things on our family. We like to put things on our income level. We like to know. I, it's, it's me, God. And all this other stuff, I can. And I know it. I choose to do otherwise. Am I making any sense here? Hey, Amen. I just want to let you know something. Here, it's important. You know, it's, it, it matters where you go to church, and it matters that you know that you're that you're in a church that's flowing in the Holy Spirit. Um, I told you it was weighing on me about family, and uh, one of the life changers. With their permission, I'm going to share this text. Just text me, and it's with their permission I share it. it says, "Good morning, Bishop." Last night, our, Latanji and I, grandmother, my mother's mother, was placed in hospice, and our family is taking it hard. With all the different personalities come different emotions. Come on, am I talking to anybody? I came to church to get a word that I need so desperately to deal with all this. Thanks for letting God use you when I needed it the most. Come on, you can do better than that. Come on. Please keep my family and I, Shantae, Tanja, the whole family in prayer. I said when I came on the stage, I had a whole lot of things I was going to share, but family dropped in my spirit. And it weighed me down. Grab your neighbor's hands. It matters. I know sometimes we get off. I know sometimes we're a little longer than what we plan in worship. But I want to be in a church with moving in the Holy Spirit. We're, we're touching and agreeing for their family. I already spoke a word, so we're thanking God for the word that he spoke. I'm not preaching about family, and the word that I'm preaching really is not a word that would address that need. But the Holy Spirit knew. When you come to church and you are thirsty for God for something, the fact that you come into a Holy Spirit driven situation, trust me, God's going to deal with it. It doesn't always have to be the word. It can be a song. You could bump into somebody on your way out of here and they say something to you that turns things around. But you would have never got it had you stayed home. One of the things, one of the things that the devil likes to do when you start going through is tell you to stay home. It's the most craziest thing that you can ever think of. But when you start going through, he'll start pulling you out. You don't need to go today. 
you know, feel sad by yourself. That is the time you need to be in the midst of the saints the most. Gracious God, we thank you for the word that you spoke to encourage their family. We touch and agree for any other family that was in need going through. We speak now peace, harmony, prosperity in that family. Bills paid, lives changed, souls saved. It is so. In Jesus' name, thank you, God, and amen. I shake that hand like you're going to shake it off. Look at him and say, I'm in agreement. I'm in agreement with his word for you. Hey, I got a word for you today. Got a word for you today. Come on and give God some praise. Got a word for you today. I'm going to I'm going to share the word but but help me today this morning. Oh, about a little after five o'clock, 28 years ago, First Lady and I were a little young couple. I was a chaplain at Moody Air Force Base, Valdosta, Georgia. And uh, First Lady had her, her baby shower the night before. You know, First Lady, she loves to laugh. If it's funny, she'll laugh. If it's not, she won't. Uh, and um, she laughed, laughed, laughed to the point that her water broke six weeks early. And so she woke up and her water had broken. It not, it, it was, and I said, honey, we, we need to go to the doctor. We need to go to the hospital. I don't want to go to the hospital. She knows I'm sharing the truth. I, I don't know. So I'll be there all day. They're just going to make me say, I said, but when, I, when we went to the OB, they said, if the water ever breaks, you're supposed to go in. Now, talking to a pregnant woman is not easy, <laughs> especially when she's about to have the baby. We ended up at the, um, at the hospital's South Georgia Medical Center right there in Valdosta and in about a few hours out popped that little fella and uh, we was just as happy as we could be so if you would help me this morning sing uh, happy birthday to our youth young adult pastor this morning amen G2 tradition in our home that the first when we get up in the morning whoever's birthday it is the tradition in our house is that we we go wake them up and sing happy birthday first thing in the morning uh, I forgot we forgot we, <laughs> look, we took you out to dinner yesterday you you're doing all of this stuff and so I said happy birthday to the most spoilers got a word for you. I want you to grab your note taker, grab your Bible, your device. Amen. If you're watching right now, we're in this, in this series and this, this is, um, I want you to grab your notes, your device, whatever the case may be. Get your pen out, your paper out if you're at home watching right now. This word this morning, I will tell you, is a transformative revelatory word. Uh, you're going to have to stay connected from start to finish. Amen. Uh, it is going to be a lot of scripture. Uh, amen. Uh, and we're really going to expound on it. And it is in succession. I will not finish everything today. 
I won't finish it today. You're going to have to connect. Amen. We're moving forward in this whole series, and um, it really is going to help you to grab this word this morning. Um, so I want you to turn with me. We're still in Genesis. We're still dealing with Abraham. I want you to turn with me to um, Genesis 14, 18 through 20b. Genesis 14, 18 through 20b. Amen. And you can see on the screen uh, how you can get my the blog notes and all of that. Um, and I post them later um, because I don't want you to get everything. I need you to really engage with me. Amen. And writing and or typing in your device. Okay, here we go. Are you ready? How many of y'all ready for the word? Yeah. Amen. All right, here we go. And Melchizedek, I want you to underline Melchizedek. King of Salem brought out bread and wine. He was priest of God most high. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram by God most high, possessor of heaven and earth. The B portion of 20 is this. Then Abram gave Melchizedek a tenth of everything. Then he gave him a tenth of everything. Father, let the words of my mouth, the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, you're my strength and you're my redeemer. Bless your word in this place. Enlarge it into me, turn to my lips of clay and the portals of heaven that you pour it out upon your people, the very seed of your word. Heavenly Father, you know the word that you've given me. You know the hearts that have gathered. You gathered them. Lord, your Holy Spirit, your Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is the one that will make all of this speak into their hearts and bring about revelation and transformation and changing in behavior. We receive what you have to say. Lord, I ask you to give me clarity of thought. Give me anointing. Do it again, but better. In the name of Jesus, it is so. In Jesus' name, thank you, God, and amen. Repeat after me, paying it forward. Look at your neighbor, say, neighbor, oh, neighbor, this morning, you're going to learn how to pay it forward. Look at your other neighbor. Say, other neighbor. Other neighbor. Oh, other neighbor. other neighbor. You're gonna learn five principles about how to be generous. You may be seated. You may be seated. There's a cultural phenomenon that has taken hold in. Um, our country and in our society. It is called paying it forward. Maybe you have had it happen to you or maybe you have done it. Someone recognizes a need just ahead of them or in some way and feel a need and is the recipient of or the giver of that need. I've been in restaurants before, and it happens in places like that. And when I've gone to pay for my dinner, then the waitress will say, someone would, had paid for it already. I have been in places and uh, having dinner, and First Lady and I, I remember quite well, we encountered um, uh, a table full of young ladies. And uh, I said, honey, it's on my heart. I didn't know them. I said, but I need, I want, I need to pick up that whole tab. I sent it over. I looked at the ticket, swallowed hard. point and the purpose of it is that if I then show generosity, then others will grab a hold of generosity 
and then it will then move forward. In our text this morning, we find that 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 is happening today is not anything new. The scriptures show us that Abraham gives Melchizedek, king of Salem, a tenth of bounty that he got after his battle against a league of nations. He won the battle and wanted to give Melchizedek thanks. Abraham did. Now you may ask, why and how is that paying it forward? The answer will require you to be attentive to some biblical history and get your paper, your pen, your device, whatever you may take notes with, both watching and in the sanctuary, and really walk through the scriptures with me this morning. Because I'm going to not only walk you through biblical history, but theological explanation. You need to know who is Melchizedek. Psalms 110 and 4. Come on, let's, let's look there. Psalms 110 and 4 says, The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. I want you to grab a hold of that phrase that they say in the order of Melchizedek. I also need you to look at Hebrews 7, 1 through 10. Hebrews 7, 1 to 10. For this Melchizedek, now, Hebrews 7, 1 through 10 is an explanation and a fuller discussion of our text that we read in Genesis 14, 17 through 20. In Hebrews 7, 1 through 10, it says this, For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him. And to him, Abraham apportioned a tenth part of everything. He, are you with me? He, Melchizedek, is without father or mother or genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life. Are you with me? But resembling the Son of God, he continues a priest forever. The word resembling the Son of God is the same language the Hebrew uses in Psalms, which is after the order of. Are you with me? All right. Now, number four. See how great this man, man being Melchizedek, was to whom Abraham the patriarch gave a tenth of the spoils. But this man, Melchizedek, who does not have his descent from them received tithes from Abraham and blessed him who had the promises. One might even say that Levi himself, Levi, coming from the Levitical tribe, who receives tithes, paid tithes through Abraham, for he was still in the loins of his ancestor, when Melchizedek met him, even Levi paid it forward because he wasn't even born then. But because Abraham is the father of nations, and from Abraham comes the 12 tribes of Israel, one of those tribes being the Levitical tribe or the priest tribe, being in the loins of Abraham because Abraham pays tithe to Melchizedek, those in his loins pay tithe to Melchizedek 
paying it forward before they ever get here. Come on, bump your neighbor and say, come on now, come on now. So, 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 so when I teach my child how to pay tithes, I am now teaching children that I will never see to be blessed because I know if I teach my child that, that child will teach their child that, that child will teach that child that, and I will be in heaven, but I would have paid it forward. God, God, you got to get it. So what does all of this mean? When the Bible says Jesus was in the order of Melchizedek, it was saying Melchizedek was a theophany appearance of Jesus. All right? Now, and I need you to grab some. As I told you, you're in a teaching church. Amen. Amen. We, we love to shout. We love to run. But we sit down and learn this word, too. Are you with me? Okay. So, in other words, Jesus showed up as the priest of God, of which Abraham paid tithe to, though Jesus wasn't born yet. Uh, we know this because Melchizedek, as the word says, look at the word, he has no beginning and he has no, come on class, so does Jesus. He has no beginning, he has no end. Melchizedek was a priest of God most high or the one that stood between God and man as an earthly priest does. What did Jesus do? He stood between God and man as the priest. Abraham gave Jesus his tithe before Jesus ever became Emmanuel God with us, word incarnate. Abraham paid his tithe before Jesus was even born. Before Abraham could realize his vision, he had to have provision. Before he could get to the promises of God, he had to ensure the provisions of God was secure. Because you can say, I got a vision with no provision, and all you have is an idea. Let me say that again. If you got a vision with no provision, all you got is what? Because you ain't got nothing to bring that vision to pass. So Abraham says, I have this tremendous vision from God, so I have to have tremendous provision from God, so I need to pay it forward to God that I might be able to have what I need when I need it. <laughs> Scripture teaches us the same thing. We mistakenly think tithes and offerings are here and now instead of also being now and later. I didn't say now laters. <laughs> I ain't talking about the candy. Scripture plainly teaches us this biblical principle, but tradition has clouded your understanding of the scriptures that I will teach you. Tradition has completely skewed the way you see the text. So I'm going to give you five principles of what it means for me to be generous or to pay it forward. Principle one, store up so you can sure up. I want you to put on your paper this, right on your paper or in your notes, however you're doing it, your device, your iPad or your phone, however you're doing it. I'm going over five principles. I'm going to give you the scripture. Then I'm going to give you the context of the scripture. You can write the word context. And then I'm going to give you the application of that scripture. I'm going to do that for all five principles. I'm going to read the scripture. 
I'm going to give you the context of that scripture. Then I'm going to give you the application of that. Are y'all with me? Come on, I need you to work with me this morning. This is going to feel like Bible study. But I will tell you that at, at here, I will not ask you to do something that I don't teach you first. Let me say it again. No, I, I, I have to teach you this word. I need you to see it in your Bible. Am I making sense? Then I have the right as your man of God to tell you to follow out what I was ta- teaching you. There's no point in me trying to tell you to do something and I never taught you the word of God. Am I right about it? Okay, so let's work with this. Here's the first principle. Store up so you can sure up. Here is Matthew 6, 19 and 20. Are you with me? All right, here it is. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. Okay, where do you put them? But lay up for yourselves where? 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 Come on, even higher. Where? Okay, I lay up treasures where? Where moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. Okay, now let's look over to Luke 12, 33 through 34. Sell your possessions and do what? Be generous. Provide yourselves with what? That do not with a where? Where? Where's the treasure? That does not where no thief approaches and no moth destroys. Now, the context of the text that we read is this. Jesus has taught his disciples about being generous. Jesus tells the disciples The disposition of their hearts is directly connected to their generosity. In both scriptures, Jesus makes a statement we rush past, gloss over, or glide through as some kind of metaphorical teaching or analogy. The phrase is treasures in heaven. Jesus makes a direct connection between what our generosity is now is affecting our eternal lives in heaven. Jesus clearly tells us that we will have ownership of treasure where? Where? Okay, and Jesus makes it very clear. Is that not right? You just read that, correct? So here's the application. Generosity that impacts generations impacts eternity. He says, now, give, be generous to the poor. Give, and then it now impacts the current generation, and it impacts eternity. Here's principle two. Rewards are for now and 1 Corinthians 3, 12 through 15. Each one's work will become manifest for the day will disclose it. I want you to notice that the word day is capitalized. It is the day of judgment. It is capitalized because there's only one. It is a definite article, the day. Not a day, but the day. The day that we are judged. Grab that. Now, on that day, if the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive what? Receive what? If anyone's work is burned up, he will do what? Though he himself will be, but only as through. Okay, let's look at Luke 16, 9 through 12. And I tell you, make friends for yourselves by means of, so that when it fails, they may receive what? In eternal dwellings. One who is faithful in a very little is also and one who is is also okay let's keep reading here we go mark 10 28 through 30 peter began to say to him see we have left what and jesus said truly i say to you 
There is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or lands for my sake and for the gospel who will not receive what? Now in this time, houses, brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecution and what were you taught in elementary school? That a conjunction connects the previous to the form following. So and means that what I get here, I now is conjuncted to what I get what? And what does it say? In the age to eternal life. All right. I'm not saved by works. No. I am saved unto good works. Is that not the book? Because I am saved unto good works, when I then do the work of God, I have rewards when I get to heaven. The mistake you have made is that you believe and have got caught up into the Hollywood understanding of heaven. That somehow or another that when you die, that wings are going to sprout out of your back and you're going to fly around heaven praising God all day. It's not in the book. Let me help you. Let me help you. Here it is. Revelations 22 and 12. Behold, I am coming soon, bringing my recompense or my rewards with me to repay each one for what he has done. I got my rewards when I come. That's what Jesus is saying. All right. Jeremiah 17 and 10 says, I, the Lord, search the heart and test the mind to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his deeds. Making any sense to you? All right. Here it is. Here it is. Oh, I love this. Here's Matthew 16, 27. It says, for the Son of Man is going to come with his angels and the glory of his Father, and then he will repay each person according to what he has done. I'm saved by grace. I'm not saved by works. But when I get saved, I'm supposed to do something. I have my time, my talent, my treasure. All three have something to do with how I live in heaven. Because what I do here matters. If it did not matter, why then don't he just snatch me out once I get saved? And why would he make me do a whole lot here and then don't give me any reward when I get over there? So I'm sick. Let's do it again because I see on your faces. I see fuzzy faces and you're going to get this word today. I, I'm saved by grace. Not by works. I'm saved unto I'm saved unto the fact that I have my time, my talent, my treasure. All three then is attributed to me as to what I do here on earth, that what I do with those three things on earth has to do with the reward I get when I get to heaven. I do not look for rewards from men on earth. He says, because if I keep looking at men, he says, you already have. You already have your reward. He says, so now if you're looking for thanks on earth from men, don't look for it when you get to heaven. So you don't do stuff to get people to say, oh, you sang today. No. You don't give in the line so that somebody can come and say, oh, look how good you are. No, I don't want that reward. The reward I want is in heaven. It's not me with wings. Making sense. Okay, we're going to work on this thing, baby. Come on, come on, grab your neighbor and say, come on, come on, let's go. 
because you're in a teaching church and I got to teach you a word and I got to move you to the place where God is saying and you got to look in this word and let's get it together. All right? Are you with me? Okay. Rewards are for now and later. Right? Okay. So here we go. Our generosity. Here's the application. If you haven't gotten it already. Uh, no, I didn't give you the context either. I got ahead of myself, didn't I? All right, here we go. This is the context of the Paul's letter to the Corinthians. Is he is discussing life at the death and judgment day. Paul establishes for the Corinthians, believers will be judged not for condemnation, but for what they have done. Judgment for believers is not the same for unbelievers. Judgment day for believers is a distribution of rewards. Because we have been justified by Jesus death and final work of the cross in the empty tomb. So judgment day for me is when I get what I have worked for. Judgment day for the unbeliever is he is sentenced for life in hell. Judgment day. No, you ain't dying, baby. Come on, grab your neighbor and say, you ain't dying. You're going to live forever somewhere. Quit thinking you're going to die. This body is going to go somewhere. But you are here forever. So on judgment day, I stand before the great white throne of judgment. He looks with me because he has burnishing the glorified Christ. He then burns away with the fire from his eyes and revelations. I don't have time to go to it. He then burns away the stubble that is no longer a part. And what is left is the reward that I have. If I am standing before him and I do not know him in the part of my sins, I am now sentenced to life in hell. To burn and feel the burn forever. If I am a believer, I am sentenced to life in heaven with rewards. Slap your neighbor, high five, say, what you going to get? What you going to get? So our generosity does not just bless us now. It blesses us later. Our generosity is not wings and flying around heaven. Our view of heaven and eternal life is showed up and screwed by Hollywood movies. Luke tells us, not only do I have rewards, I have relationships in heaven. Is that what he says? He says, now make sure you have friends in eternity. Mark tells us, through the mouth of Jesus, there are levels of living in eternity. To whom much is given, if I was faithful over a little bit, then I get a little bit. Is that not right? He says, come into in, my servant, for you have been faithful over. Then I will make you ruler. Now, if you're going to be ruler, then what are you ruling? There is something you are ruling. Just recently published in the in a uh, periodical and talked about how uh, four and a half light years from our Milky Way is a super Earth. Four and a half light years. You know that one light year is the, is the distance of 186,000 miles per hour that will go over a year's time. Four and a half light years is next to our Milky Way is a super Earth. This, they just discovered it, right? A super earth, a super earth, can you say a super earth? Now a super earth means that it, it has to have inhabitants. You see, some of you all think that God is only the God of earth. How can God create heaven and earth and he just made you and me? Your mind has to go beyond here because if he has a kingdom, he has to have some princes. And he has to have some children. And I'm not going to be like Harry and Meghan. I am not giving up my rights. 
Help me, God. I understand what they're dealing with. I know what they're going through. But I am a child of the Most High God. And that when I enter in, he has a reward for me. So I'm waiting for which planet I'm going to be over. Bump your neighbor, bump your neighbor. See, see, some of y'all just think you're going to just be sitting around here with wings out of your back. Grab your neighbor and say, come on, you ain't going to be over no convenience store. <laughs> you're setting yourself up for eternity. I told you, I'm expanding your, I got to expand your thinking. Just like when I taught you years ago about first fruit. When I taught you years ago about first fruit, you said, oh, my God, ooh, bishop. But you grabbed it. And as a result of you grabbing it, God blessed you. Did he not? He blessed you beyond measure. I'm grabbing you again. And I'm saying, come on, grab this word. I'm not going to tell you anything that's not in this word. Okay, are you with me? Come on, I got to pick up my speed here. Generosity gets a real-time heavenly response. Acts 10 and 4. Acts 10 and 4. It says this. And he said to him, your prayers and your alms have ascended as a what? Okay, here's the context of what's going on. All right, Peter is prejudiced. Okay? He needs to be taught how to deal with other races. As a result of this, God raises up Cornelius, who's a Gentile, that he's going to bring Peter into his house and make him understand that whatever he cleans is clean. All right, this is the context. Now, in this, Cornelius is visited and said, God has received the alms. Alms is generosity to the poor. He says that it's a memorial in heaven. Come on, is that not what you see? So it's a memorial. What's a memorial? We have war memorials, is that not right? When you have a memorial, what is it there for? To remember. How long is it there? So if there is a memorial for what Cornelius gives, why does it need to be there forever if it's not there until he gets to heaven to see what he's done? When you are generous, God blesses you then but then he sets up a memorial that he is aware of. If the mem who's the memorial there if it's not for the folk on your road right now to see how much a giver you were? Look, come on, look up and down the road. Since I got some memorials. Now, how big is your memorial? Some of our memorials is like that. Then other memorials are, but when we get to heaven, we're going to be able to see. Am I putting it, am I, am I, am I, am I putting something else in the book other than what you see? All right, let's keep moving. Let's keep moving. Oh, this is good to me, whether it's good to you or not. It's good to me. Okay, here we go. Here it is. Here's principle number four. Procrastination prevents provision for your vision. You see, one, two, and three was to get you there. But as sure as I get you to the revelation and you get ready to be generous, Satan's going to tap you on the shoulder and tell you, uh, nah, that sounds good, but I don't know. I got to read some more. I got to go talk to the poor pit. I, no, I got to go talk to the pew pastor. Come on, every church got pew pastors. I pastor you, then you got to go check in with the pew pastor. Pew 
pastor's your friend, somebody you you checking in with, and they gotta they gotta regard, they gotta then co-sign what I say. One of your neighbor said, Bishop don't need no co-signing today. The word is my co-signing. Here it is. Here it is. Look at here. Ecclesiastes 11 and 4, what does it say? Farmers who, for perfect weather, never plant. If they watch, they, I'm here to tell you, that just speaks for itself. I ain't got to tell you the context. I ain't got to tell you the application. It's self-explanatory. If you keep waiting, you will never receive. If you keep waiting for the perfect time, when all my bills are lined up, then I'm on tithe. After I get, when I hit that lottery, I'm on, you know what? When my, when my ship come in, when your ship come in, you're going to do the same thing you've been doing while your ship is out to sea. <laughs> ain't nothing going to change. You ain't all of a sudden going to get a huckabuck and then, you know, hey, glory. You know what I'm talking about, a huckabuck. Some of y'all don't know what I'm talking about. You get, hey, glory. Oh, boy, I'm giving now. No, you're not. The money you got now and doing what you're doing with is what you're going to do when you get more of it. Money don't change a person. It just shows us more of who you are. Come on, let me say it again. Money does not change you. It just shows us more of who you are. Here's the fifth and final thing. Look at your neighbor and says, Lord, I'm so glad he got here. If you're watching right now, I want to invite you. You need to keep this. This is, this is one of the most uh, profound uh, teachings with respect to generosity that you're going to grab. It is not the standard word that somebody's going to quote Malachi to you and then demand you tithe. No, I got to give you a word. I got to take you beyond the norm because that's the type of church we are. Amen? Okay, here we go. Here's the last thing. Number five. Paying it forward accepts the reality, eternity, is forever. We circle all the way back to Genesis 14, 19b. All the way back. Here we go. Blessed be Abram by God most high, creator of heaven and earth. Okay? Abram paid it forward. He had the awesome opportunity to meet Jesus before Jesus was born. He ties to Jesus before tithing is instituted. His faithful walk was commended to him as righteous. Abram Ham is a prime example of getting a vision and understanding part of the journey to the realization of the vision is to pay it forward. But Abraham's vision is so tremendous, he has to make sure he pays it forward and understand what's going on. This How we view it. This is eternity. This is life. You can't see the end, can you? But of eternity and of life, this is the portion you live. Can you see it? So we operate in life with our time, our talent, and our treasure, and our generosity as if this is all there is. Mm. 
not understanding that my life is made up of all of this. You see, some of us, we, 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 I'm going to tithe, I'm going to tithe, and, and so I can get some back right now. And if I don't get a check by Monday, because that's what the prophet told me. That's why we don't play that. Unless the God is speaking that, no, we don't do that. Now, first lady, every now and then, God will give her something like that, and we will come back and tell you that's what God said, and that's what God did, just like I read you that text. But the bottom line is, I'm not tithing so I can get a check by Monday. I'm tithing based on this little tip. And when you give and are generous with your time, your talent, and your treasure based on this tip, then you soon run out. You soon get tired. You soon say, oh, I'm forget. Oh, there ain't nothing to this. You forget you got all of this to live. There's a life of rewards. There's eternity that I will receive from God. Not just now. Why do you think he's so limited that he has to crunch everything into now? That's why when I leave here, trust me, when I leave here, I got on my beneficiary, on my life insurance policy, I said that 10% because I'm going to make sure I got something going forward. On my life insurance policy. I said, first lady going to get it all? No. God going to get 10 to that. Why? Why? Because I'm going to make sure that there's something going forward for me. So today, let's change our generosity. Today, I'm going to pay it forward. Not only am I going to pay it forward, I'm going to live it forward. Not only am I going to live it forward, I'm going to give my time and my talent and my treasure forward. I'm going to be generous because I'm not just living for now. I'm living forever. You will not die. Somewhere, you're going to live the rest of your life. This is just a clay temple that you have temporary occupancy of it. But you will live what? Forever. How will I live my life? When I get to heaven, I don't know. Let me say this. It's going to rock your world, and we're going to stand. Um, one of our, one of our, um, one of our um, leaders in the church, he always says, he says, you know what? And we talk about education, and you know, we say with Jesus and education, you're unstoppable, right? And we always say that here. And uh, he always says, you know what? You can go to school, but you're either going to live in an A house, a B house, a C house, a D house, or F house. In other words, if you go to school and mess around and, and, and make nothing but uh, D's and F's, trust me, that's the type of lifestyle you're going to live when you get out of school. Am I making any sense? <laughs> he says, so you better go to school and do good so you make A's and B's because when you get out, that's the life you're going to live because ain't nobody giving D's and F folk any kind of job that anybody wants. Come on, am I preaching in here? Am I preaching good right now? He says, so you got you to gotta work hard in school so that when you get out of school, you can get a job commensurate to the education and the grades you made. Am I making any sense? Some of us just trying to get into heaven. I'm just going to get in. I'm just going to slip in. Oh, if I can just get in. But I'm here to tell you, I'm going to live my life here so that when I get in, I'm going to be living in an A house. Now, you can make it in if you want to. I already know that some of y'all ain't going to be living on my street. Help me, God. 
slap your neighbor, high five, and say, you, you, you want to live on my street? You better live that way right now, baby. You see, you trying to wait until, oh, wait, no, you better live the way you want to live for eternity right now. See, somebody fooled you when it came to heaven. Somebody changed and messed you up when it came to talking about heaven. Yes, you're going to live in eternity. But how is it that I'm going to live eternity in the same old low lifestyle that I'm living right now? I want responsibility when I go to heaven. I want solar systems under me when I go to heaven. I want to be running things. I want art angels and, and what have you around me. I want to be dispatching orders when I go to heaven. He says when I come in, he'll make me ruler. When I get to heaven, I want something to do. And I don't want just a little bit. And you might be working for me. So you better come on up. Come on, take your neighbor. Seat. Take your neighbor. Seat. Now this is some new revelation here. Come on, stand to your feet. I ain't done. I ain't done. I got to stop. I'm out of time. Some of y'all glazed over anyhow. You can't take no more. <laughs> oh, I see it. I see it. Is it. This revelation is such a, oh my God, you can't take another revelation right now. Grab your neighbor by the hand. Say, it's going to be all right. You are in a church that teaches you the word. I do not make it up. We read that scripture for yourself. Amen. I can hold my ear. I can come and holler and hoop and do all of that. And you'll leave out of here with no knowledge, no revelation, not knowing how to conduct your life. Or we can take you to this word. How many of you got a word today? So here we go. Here we go. I'm going to finish this next week. We're going to be in church Wednesday night. We're going to get revelation. This, this 2020 is going to be your year. Come on, come on. Give God some glory right there. 2020 is going to be your year. 2020 is going to be your year. But we're not going to just give you something, oh, we all happy on New Year's Eve. We all happy on the first Sunday. No, I got to plant this word in you. Grab hands. Look at them. Look at your neighbor right and left. Say, so come on here. If you don't, I'm going to leave you. Come on, look at them. Look at them. If you don't, I'm going to leave you. Drop, drop your hand and do this to him. Deuces. Deuces. I'm out. I'm out, baby. I'm out. I ain't hanging around here to get no mediocre word, no mediocre life. The devil is a liar. I ain't living like that. I'm out. I'm out. Come on if you want to. Father, we come before you now. Lord, I... I've delivered what you have given me to deliver to the people. I believe, Father, your word. I believe the power of your word. There's no coercion in your word. There's no arm twisting in your word. It's simply teaching your word. And I know, Father, when your word is taught, the people's lives will change. For your word will not go out and return void accomplish what it was set for you to do. It is so. There are people here now that need to connect with this word, connect with this church. Squeeze your neighbor's hands. I need to connect. I need to connect. I need to be a part of this ministry. I need to get this word so my life will change. Squeeze your neighbor's hand. Squeeze your neighbor's hand. I need to rededicate my life. I've been living any kind of way, doing whatever I want. I haven't been living for eternity. I've been living for that little small tip. Squeeze your neighbor's hand. Squeeze your neighbor's hand. Now, if someone squeeze your hand, if someone squeeze your hand, then kindly, gently, but firmly bring them to the altar. The doors are
of the church is open. Whosoever will let him come. The day that you hear my voice, I'm not your heart. Squeeze your neighbor's hand. I want to connect. vision for the vision that God has given us. Amen. We have a vision. Minister G2 is coming to give us the benediction. I'll see you at the door. Please, Sunday, Sunday, uh, uh, Wednesday, I'm sorry, Wednesday, revival. Amen. Revival will have you. There'll be a word in the house. Amen. What a word. What a word. Why don't you give God a hand clap of praise for the word. Amen. Powerful revelatory word. It's always good to get substance. Amen. It's one thing to have a preacher to shout at you, but it's another thing for him to break it down so that we can understand it. Amen. Amen. Turn to your neighbor. Say neighbor. Oh, neighbor. This week, I don't know about you. But I'm going to be generous. Amen. Amen. If you believe it, give the Lord a hand of praise. If you believe that. First, second, third time guests, y'all give it up again. I know I got you clapping a lot. First, second, and third time guests, y'all give it up for them. If you are first, second, or third time guests with us this morning, we want to just love on you a little bit more. We want to give, put a gift in your hand and introduce you to our bishop and first lady. Just want to take a couple minutes of your time uh, so you can feel free to come to the front after the prayer. Amen. Please meet us here if you have life group at 6 o'clock p.m. on Wednesday. And then, of course, 7 o'clock um, for the revival. Amen. Uh, all those two, if you um, are available tomorrow, most of us should have off. But if you are available, please come to the MLK breakfast. Amen. We want to be here to support uh, what's happening and taking place in the community. So that starts at 830. You can grab your tickets in the lobby. Amen. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for the word, God. We thank you, Lord, for giving us provision for the vision, God. We thank you, Lord, for giving us the opportunity, Lord, to be generous and to give so that we can be prepared for eternity and a life of rewards after we move and transition on to heaven. Father, we love you. We pray that you will bless the balance of our week. Give us safe, merciful travel, even if it's just around the corner. It's in your precious son, Jesus' name, we pray and declare it done. Thank God and amen. Hug somebody on your way out.